It's that time this morning. It feels like 8.30 as it says on the wall back there, but it's really 9.30 and time for us to get started this morning. I turned my clocks forward last night about 7.30, thought I'm going to get in the mood really early for going, you know, so I can get my mind right for going to bed early and I'm not sure it really worked, but I tried anyway. I'm not one to go to bed early. All right. Well, we're going to be on page 10 of our workbook, beginning on page 10, uh, moving very quickly to page 11 this morning in our workbook. So if you do not have the workbook, there are probably copies on the back tables. If you need to grab one, feel free to do so. Um, and we'll be in Hebrews, beginning in Hebrews chapter 7 this morning, Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, as we uh, begin our discussion today. Of course, I, Max is uh, still in Africa, and so I will continue to fill in for him. I think it's three, three more class periods, if I am correct, that uh, he'll be covering for Max, and then he will be back to finish up the quarter. All right, well, before we go any further in our study this morning, begin our study, let's pause and have a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads together. Our God and our Father in heaven, we come to you, we thank you for this day, we thank you for this time that we have to be gathered here this morning to study your word, and we pray that as we open up this book and we look that we will find things that we can apply to our lives, that we may grow closer to you. We pray that you'll be with all who are unable to be here today, and particularly be with our three men who are traveling, doing work in Africa this month. We pray that you'll be with them and keep them safe from harm as they do good work on our behalf in that place. We pray that you'll be with us all throughout the remainder of this morning and this day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. So, we, um, about 10 of us on Wednesday night were gathered in here. It was a little more than that, but not many. Um, obviously, the weather was awful Wednesday night. Uh, maybe some of you who were unable to actually get here if you had electricity maybe you were able to watch online but of, of course uh, yeah it was uh, we were pretty few in number on Wednesday evening as the weather was just terrible and uh, so good to see all of you back this morning uh, and, and in attendance so because of because Wednesday night being so light I thought I would back up just a little bit and do uh, just a quick review uh, if you will of what we discussed on Wednesday night I'll try not to make this uh, really long, um, but um, you know, we talked about Wednesday night on page, we looked at the top of page uh, 10 there, we talked about faithfulness and how long is faithfulness required, faithfulness is required what? Until death, until, death, until the end, yeah, and, um, and so we talked about what constitutes faithfulness to Christ, what constitutes faithfulness to Christ? Obedience, okay, obedience to his word. Uh, complete obedience to his word would constitute uh, faithfulness. Um, uh, we talked about the two things that God did regarding Abraham and what guarantees his word. I think there was a couple of thoughts um, uh, on that. Um, I, I was thinking along the lines of, of the blessings, the fact that God told him he was going to multiply him, he was going to bless him. Um, I believe there was another thought along those, uh, another thought on that as well. Um, we talked about what Abraham did after God made his promises to him. After Abraham made his promises, what did, what did, or God made his promises, what did Abraham do? He, he waited patiently. He waited patiently on God to fulfill, um, to fulfill his plan um, and, trust in, and trust in the Lord and he, and he proceeded patiently and obediently, doing whatever it was that God asked of him to do, uh, that is what he did. Uh, it's impossible for God to lie. Why? Because he is, because he is perfect. It's out of his nature. Uh, it's contrary to his nature because he is perfect. Um, and then we talk about, talked about the fact that hope is an anchor for our soul. We talked about the veil and what it meant to be behind the veil and how... Christ is now our intercessor 
uh, with uh, into heaven to God. Uh, and that was in the Levitical priesthood, of course, only the high priest could, um, could serve in that role. And we'll talk about that actually more in our material, uh, in our material today. As we drop down to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> chapter 7, we talked a little bit about Salem. Where is Salem? What did we determine about Salem? It's Jerusalem, right? It's, uh, it's literally Jerusalem. We looked at a couple of passages, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18, Psalm 76 and verse 2 that might help us in determining that, but it was actually uh, um, a term that was used for Jerusalem. Um, and we talked about uh, question 2. According to Hebrews 7 and 2, Hebrew, uh, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and what was the point the, the writer was trying to make? So what was the point that the writer of Hebrews was making in, in the fact that, that Melchizedek uh, received tithes from Abraham? Yeah, recognize, Abraham recognized him as high priest. He recognized him as one of authority uh, and, and, and in this place of honor. And we'll kind of hit that. Um, on this uh, next question, and I think this is, is kind of where uh, perhaps we, we hit question three maybe very, very quickly, uh, I think it was on Wednesday night, um, at kind of as the bell was ringing or right after the bell. So we'll pick up there this morning, talk in a little bit more detail. Uh, Melchizedek is said to be without father, without mother, without genealogy. Are we to understand this literally, and if not, why not? What do you think on that? We, we touched on this a little Wednesday night, but are we to think about this fact that he is without father, without mother, without genealogy, literally? Uh, I see some heads shaking no. Well, why not? Okay, so, okay, I, I, yeah, the idea that it wasn't, it, we know it's not recorded, right, in history, absolutely. What else? Okay, Jesus was the only begotten son of, of God, I, uh, yeah, absolutely, what else? Yeah, I mean, and I think the point, I think that's really just the point here with Melchizedek as we look at the fact here that there just wasn't a record of his lineage. And I think that's more the point. It wasn't oh, the Levitical priesthood. What was very, very important about the Levitical priesthood? You've got to come from the tribe of Levi. We're going to talk about that more this morning. But, but your lineage mattered, well, it, it's all, it, it mattered a great deal, didn't it? Uh, your lineage was very, very important. But the lineage is, with Melchizedek, it wasn't important here to the fact that he, God was using him. He was appointed, uh, or he was, he was priest forever here, uh, and, and we, it just wasn't important. It wasn't something uh, that, that God chose to record for us um, in Scripture. So we just don't know. Uh, there's only, as we mentioned Wednesday night, there's only two mentions of Melchizedek uh, outside of this Hebrews passage. And actually, um, one of these is a quote from, uh, from the Psalms passage. But Genesis 14 and verse 18, and then Psalm 110 and verse 4. So what we do know is that Abraham recognized Melchizedek as, as being God's representative and thus uh, paying tithes and giving him that respect. Any questions, comments about that? Okay. Um, we briefly talked about three things that I had read, and, I, and I'm, just, I'm not saying that any of these are the case. In fact, I think the first two are totally not the case. Uh, but uh, just to throw a few things out there, people, 
people speculate about where Melchizedek came from, who he was. Uh, there was the one theory that he was actually uh, Shem, the son of Noah, who was king and priest to their ancestors. So uh, Melchizedek is the way he's named here in this passage, uh, but it was actually Shem. And uh, that's uh, it's probably not likely the case. Um, there's another theory that it was Christ, that it was actually Christ appearing uh, in the Old Testament. Um, I think you can discount that one um, for, a num- for a number of reasons, uh, but we talked, about, uh, we talked about that on Wednesday evening, the fact that if we look at, well, even in, even in this passage itself, in this passage, if you look further over Hebrews 9, 28, it says something about Christ coming when he comes a second time. And if uh, Christ had been actually Melchizedek, and then come as himself, then the next coming would be the third coming of Christ. And that just, that doesn't make sense, okay? But there are, you know, when we don't know, when we don't know, scholars speculate. And they try to come up with theories and, and tell us what the answers are. Yes, sir. Yeah, right. It, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, God made him a type. And if, so if you identify him, yeah, it, it destroys his type. Okay. And yeah, and, and so if we look at the third, the third theory that some have said is that, that the, and this is the most general opinion according to the uh, commentary I read, was that he was an actual Canaanite king who who reigned in Salem, and he kept religion and worship of the true God, uh, and so he was honored by Abraham as such, that he actually was a king in, in, in Israel, so, or in Jerusalem. But again, as I said, when, when we don't know, sometimes scholars speculate. And we could read, uh, you know, just think about all of the things that we don't know, and, and we know according to Scripture we can't know, and yet people have tried to give us answers to. You know, one of the things that I think about that we hear over and over again is, um, remember, was it March 15th, 2000, and was it 14 or 15 was going to be the second coming, or uh, the, the next coming of Christ, second coming of Christ. And then, oh, we missed that date. It's really October 15th. And if you look back in history, there has been hundreds of dates set. Well, the fact is, is Christ said we can't know the answer to that. And there's just some things we don't know, and we have to accept some things that we don't know. We think, again, a, a passage we we'll bring up over and over again is Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. Curtis, yeah, you had a comment. Yeah, certainly, certainly what is special about Melchizedek is the fact that, uh, and, and the reason why there was no other priest like him that is recorded for us, is that it's not according or after the Levitical priesthood, which is laid out very specifically because, as Curtis pointed out, this was before the, the children of Israel. And, and so we just don't have those things recorded. And, and Christ is, and, that, and that's what the comparison is, is Christ is a priest in that order, in that way. Christ coming after the three promises are fulfilled, after the nation of Israel, and actually being, um, being a, a subject to Jewish law uh, as he was raised and, and lived on the earth, actually become actually subject to Jewish law, well then, um, it, it would make sense then that he should follow the, the, the rules, if you will, of, of the priesthood. But God says, no, he's different in that regard. He's not according to that Levitical priesthood. And we will talk about that a little bit more as chapter 7 uh, continues uh, in, in that vein as we continue on. So the unusual characteristic about Melchizedek was is that he had what? No succession. That means what? No succession. He had no, none before him, none, none after him. It wasn't inherited, if you will, is appointed by God, uh, no mention of a priest like him or after him, um, and, and Jesus had 
uh, was the same. He had no predecessor, no successor, and he is priest forever. Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 7, verses 4 through 10. Let's read through Hebrews 7, 4 through 10, and answer question number 5. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. From, um, though these are descended from Abraham... I'm sorry, I didn't read that very well at all. Verse 5. And those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his des uh, descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In, this, in the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. And so, how is it, question 5 here, um, it says Hebrews 7, 4 through 10 proves that the priesthood of Melchizedek was superior to that of Levi. See if you can explain the arguments, argument in your own words. So who thinks they can explain this passage in a, in a brief commentary format for us to help us understand it? I don't want to. I'm going to let you guys do it. Yeah, so that's one aspect of it, that, that the Levitical priesthood who, were, who descended from Abraham were in, in a theory, in a, in, a, in a form, paying tithes to Melchizedek, showing Melchizedek uh, being superior to Abraham. Okay, all right. Anything else? Melchizedek, how do we know Melchizedek was superior to Abraham? Does that passage tell us it? It says, it says so. How do we know? Okay, he's appointed by God. And Abraham had to pay tithes to him. Okay? And the, the, the superior always blesses the inferior. Right? The, the superior always blesses uh, the inferior. So certainly Abraham recognized Melchizedek as a superior representative um, of God. By the way, I think that would be uh, kind of the three theories that I mentioned earlier. I think that's sort of the problem I would see there with three is that theory says, well, that Abraham just recognized him and honored him because of that. And I think it's more than that. I think Abraham uh, would have respected him because I think God would have uh, been, he would have God, God appointed. Yes, sir. Confused on verse five and six. Confused on verse five and six. Max will be back in two weeks. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that the, those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have, com have commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, uh, though these are also descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had, uh, who had the promises. Um, received tithes from Abraham. But this man who does not have... yeah. Um, I think it's just saying that, you know, the Levitical priesthood, uh, and someone else can help me out if I'm mistaken on this, uh, but the Levitical priesthood was really respected as uh, the priest of God, appointed by God, and the point being that here was a priest, a, a priest that God recognized, a, a high priest, um, appointed by God here, and that in some sense, the Levitical priesthood would have even been inferior to this priest, because even Abraham paid tithes to, um, to, to this man. Now, okay, Curtis is going to bail me out. He's going to answer this, and I don't have to say anything else. Go ahead. But you've got to say it loud.
So they paid tithes to, to the descendants of, of Abraham. They couldn't pay, couldn't hear Curtis, that they could, he couldn't pay tithes. They couldn't pay tithes to the descendants of Melchizedek, nor would I think God expect them to, even if they knew who the descendants of Melchizedek were, because they were commanded to pay tithes to, um, to the descendants, to the Levites, to, to uh, the Levitical priesthood. Yes, sir. Well, we're not given that, that information, that it was a commandment to tithe. I, I don't know why Abraham did this. It's very possible that that was the case. He was acting by faith. Okay. And to act by faith, there has to be a commandment. Okay. So, so maybe it's an, something that wasn't recorded for us, but something that was expected uh, of Abraham. And I think that's, that's a very reasonable, uh, very reasonable thought there. As I was thinking about a little bit more, uh, it's a lesson's question there. You know, our kids, we sing a song with our kids sometime called Father Abraham. And um, when we talk about Abraham being the father, he was the father of what? He was the father of the Israelites, children of Israel, right? He was regarded as in very high, he was very highly regarded, right, among the Israelite nations. Um, if you even, if you look through the Exodus and, and, and even later in Genesis and a lot of the stories, Abraham was just held in high regard, recognized as being the one through whom God used to, to bring the promises. Those stories were passed down from generation to generation, and it was very well known, and, and Abraham was very well respected. And yet, I think what this is saying is that here's Abraham who paid tithes to a man on this earth who God appointed, and, and, and it wasn't this priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, that we all are used to reading about. This was something special. Well, Christ is something special in that he is, um, again, a shift, if you will, from... And we're going to talk about this, I believe it's, it's on the next page, the question number seven, the shift from the, the law to the old law to the new law. This is something different and something better, uh, something better. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, I hope, I hope that's as good as I can do if it doesn't, all right? So any, any other question or comment about this? I appreciate that question. Any other questions or comments? Said, we, we have questions, we'll try to talk through these things together and, and understand them the best that we can. Uh, let's flip over to the next page, to page number 11. Um, was perfection found in the Levitical priesthood? Yes or no? Was, Le, was perfection found in the Levitical priesthood? No. No, perfection was not found in the Levitical priesthood. Why? Explain that. Okay. The sin was not gone. Okay, so sin was not gone. The Levitical priesthood was only capable of covering sin, right? But there was a remembrance of sin year after year. And so if you, if you think about it, it sort of mounted up, I guess, year after year, this big burden of sin. And, and so the priests could, could cover the sin, uh, and yet they couldn't take away the sin. It was not perfect in that regard. Someone else have a comment. I heard some, somebody say something over here. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So the high priest first had to offer sacrifice for himself because he was he was not perfect, um, and so if he was not perfect, uh, it, it, it just. Let me ask you this: Was it was it just a bad thing? The Levitical priesthood it just didn't work. Is that is that right? And God had to come up with something else? No, that's not the case. The Levitical priesthood certainly served a purpose, didn't it? It served God's purpose for His people. But it was not perfect by any regard. If the Levitical priesthood had been perfect, there was no need for a second, for a second priesthood. If the Levitical priesthood was perfect, 
there was no need for a second priesthood. Which brings us to Christ. If Christ's sacrifice is perfect, is there a need for another? There's not a need for another. That's right. And so, so in that regard, Christ is priest forever. Because there's no need for anything better. Had the Levitical priesthood been perfect, it would have been, they would have been priests forever in regard to, say, the lineage or, or so forth. They would have served in that role. But they weren't. And therefore, uh, Christ was appointed as the high priest. And so uh, that, that, I think that's a, a, a good answer there. So since the priesthood, question 7, was changed, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12, the blank had to be changed as well. The law. The law had to be changed as well. And why was this so? Say that again. Okay. They changed the priesthood. Okay, so it was going to require something different. What else? The sacrifice was changed. Uh, the old law, under the old law, the sacrifice was... Okay, the blood of bulls and goats. It was blood, but it was the blood of bulls and goats. Um, you know, and again, we just... I, we don't really grasp, I think, just how... You know, they talked about just how bloody, if you will, that whole process was. There were thousands of animals that were sacrificed um, annually, right? That this was a very... Uh, it, and, it, and it just, it was imperfect. It, it wasn't capable, as we said, of, of the forgiveness of sins, only the covering of sins. And yet when Christ came along, uh, the sacrifice, did it, it, did it change from blood to something else? No, it was still a blood sacrifice, but it was a blood sacrifice of a perfect nature, meaning it never had to be done again. There was no, per, no need uh, uh, for such. Um, so if you think about the old law, the old law was very regimented, if you will. What do I mean by that? Hundreds of commandments, yeah. You know, we, we, we read about the controversy in our nation about whether or not the Ten Commandments should be posted here or there, and, and the Ten Commandments are talked about, and certainly there were Ten Commandments that we know God wrote on the stone, but the law contained hundreds of commandments. And not just a hundred things you ought to do, not add to your faith knowledge, and to your knowledge, self-control. It wasn't that. It was very regimented. On this day of this month, you do this. And, on, and if, if this happens, you do this. And if this happens, you do this. And, and, and just very, very regimented and, and, and not, and, and different. Yes. Okay, it had to do with their life and with their health, and, and, that's, and that's true as well. And, and they needed, and part of that was they, they were a people who became a nation, and they needed to be governed. It was very specific yeah. about what, what um, animal they gave and yes. this particular sin. So they were sacrificing, weren't they sacrificing every day? Yeah, uh, yeah. Doing... Very, very specific and very, yeah, just... Very burdensome, if you will, um, in, in, in that regard. Very burdensome. Uh, and so it was very traditional. Very, uh, a lot of cust customs were important. Uh, we know uh, the um, genealogy was very, very important under the old law, specifically in regard to the priesthood. Uh, but that, that was very important as well. So um, there was a lot of things there that had to be changed or that were changed uh, by Christ uh, when, he, when He died on the cross. And so, because the sacrifice and, and worship and everything changed, 
at the cross. And, and listen, that's what we have to understand about when we look at how our worship is governed. We can't, we, we go back to the Old Testament and we know that the Old Testament is to be an example for us. We see how God dealt with people. We see, uh, we see, we learn many, many things from the Old Testament, but what we can't learn from the Old Testament, we can learn about the foundation of our salvation, but we can't learn about what we must do to be saved there. That's, those commands are given in the new law. But also in regards to worship. They worshiped in a different way in the Old Testament than they do than, than we are commanded to worship in the new law, under the new law. And so we can't use, well, David did this or they did that under the old law. We can't use that as justification for things that we might do in our worship. We've got to have new law justification, new law um, confirmation for the things that we do in our worship. Uh, I, I'm trying to think of the passage. Someone can help me out where it says that if you, try to, if you try to keep part of the law, you have to keep the whole law, okay? It, and so you, you're under the burden of the whole law, and no one wants to be under the burden of the whole law. In fact, I don't, maybe, maybe in other parts of the country, I don't know in any, anywhere in the United States that people are trying to uh, make an attempt even of keeping the whole law and all of the sacrifices and and those sort of things that would have would have gone along with it. So, so things change. We live under a new law, not under this this old old law that we read about through the Levitical priesthood. Um, any question or comment before we move along? All right. Uh, why could Jesus not serve as high priest under the law of Moses? He was not of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. And so turn over to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles and verse, uh, chapter 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 26 uh, beginning in verse 18. Beginning in verse 18. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests of the sons of Abraham, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. And then Isaiah was angry. What is it saying? Look, here's a guy who was trying to burn incense and offer sacrifice and and maybe even do what he had seen Levitical priests do. He said, I want to do that. I want to offer those sacrifices. And they, they told him, they rebuked him and said, you bring what? No honor to God. Because you're not obeying God. That task, if you will, is reserved for the Levitical priesthood. Christ was not part of that Levitical priesthood, and therefore he could not have served as a priest under the old law. Um, question, comment. All right. What does the term annulling mean? Annulling, huh? To end? To, to make no effect, of no effect, okay? Set aside? Okay, I got one thing, he says legally invalid or void. When we hear the term annul today, uh, that term is heard mostly in regards to what? Marriage, Marriage right? And, and uh, in Catholicism, I think particularly, right, uh, where marriages uh, may be annulled, to may be made of, of no, uh, of, well, I think the term, uh, the, the definition here of to declare or make legally invalid or void. Well, this passage tells us here in, in Hebrews 7, it talks about annulment, annulling, but it says here that what is annulled? What, be, what becomes annulled? The law, right? The law, um, the law becomes annulled. Uh, let's look here. I think it's in verse, is it 18? Is it in verse 18? Or, yeah. I'm lost all of a sudden. Somebody help me out. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, back in 16, who has become a priest not of the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but of the power of the indestructible life, for it is witnessed of him, you are priests forever after the order of Melchizedek, for on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So, Here we see uh, that the old law is set aside or annulled uh, in in favor of a new law, a better hope, uh, as it's described here um, in in this passage. Um, What else do we see here, though, about this, this old law? It says it was annulled. Why? Okay, no perfection. It's weakness, as the English Standard Version says. It's uselessness, it says. Uselessness. Um, And it made nothing perfect. Yeah, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced uh, by which we draw near to God. So, uh, So we learn here something about the old law, something we've already been talking about, that it is It is weak and useless to God at this point. Not bad, it served its purpose, but it is no longer useful for God's purpose. Yes, sir. There would be no cleansing absolutely without the blood of Christ. Yes, no cleansing absolutely without the blood of Christ. Yeah. Um, Any other comments? Questions? Everybody slept an extra, or no, got an hour less sleep last night. It's kind of quiet today. I saw one cruel guy last night put on the internet, reminder, everyone set your clocks ahead one hour. Uh, it was Daniel Lee, who we all know. He was being very cruel. Or no, he said, roll your clocks back an hour. That's what it was. See, I, I messed that up. But he was, uh, he was trying to fool us. It took me a while to read it, but uh, good old cell phones. They, they keep us on track these days. Um, all right. Question number 10, question 10. Hebrews 7 and 19 speaks of a better hope. What is it that gives us a better hope? The precious blood of Christ. Okay, the precious blood of Christ. What other thoughts? Okay, yeah, the sacrifice is another way of putting that, right? The sacrifice... Um, the sacrifice that is being that is being perfect. That's what makes it better. It's the blood sacrifice involved here. It's the precious blood of Christ as opposed to the imperfect blood of, of bulls and goats uh, that were used uh, under the old law. Um, and therefore our perfect sacrifice, our perfect sacrifice died, shed his blood, and yet lives forever, uh, lives forever with God. And that uh, makes for a, a better hope, um, better hope for us. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. That that's a very good very good point is that that hope is out there. That better hope is out there. That sacrifice has been made for all. Uh even even as the sacrifice was being made, Jesus on the cross said, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." Je- what is Jesus saying is that that the hope or the sacrifice is is for everyone, right? But remember when the story is being told on the day of Pentecost. And Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. 
And he's preaching to these people, many in the audience perhaps, who had been there, when Je- had been a part of Jesus' crucifixion, had been there. He, he says to them in, in Acts, let's turn over to Acts chapter 2, and let's see how they came into contact with the hope, the better hope. In Acts chapter 2, um, and uh, let's go back to, um, well, look at verse 36. We won't go back too far. He says, let all of the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 37 says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, how do we obtain that, sac- how, that hope? How do we come into contact with that blood? By being buried with Him in baptism. Yes, sir? A better law. A better law. Yeah, a better law as well. Any, any other thoughts on that? We, well, we could go to Romans 6 too. And, uh, Romans 6 as well. That whole chapter there in Romans 6 talking about uh, really gives us a good picture of, of baptism, being baptized into his death, uh, and, and, the, and the, the representation of baptism as, being joining, as joining Christ in his death and being raised again. But yeah, we've got to come in, to Gary's point, we've got to come into contact with the blood of Christ in order to be a part of that, uh, of that better... Uh, better hope, um, if you will. And, and you know, if, if you, just to take that thought a little bit further, if you look into the Old Law, or the Old Testament, if you will, let's just go back to Old Testament times, were there people outside of the children of Israel that were obedient to God, who were worshipers of God? Yeah, I mean, we find examples of that. We, we think, well, the children of Israel were God's chosen people. They were the only ones. Well, they were God's chosen people. They were special in, in that regard. And we know that it wasn't until, until, um, until the book of Acts in the New Testament that, that Gentiles, this, this, uh, this new law and, and the blood of Christ offered or, or extended to the Gentiles. And yet, even in the Old Testament, in the old times, we see non-Jews who were respectful of God and respectful of His law, and yet they were on the outside looking in, not part of something of that of a, of a better hope, if you will, a better law at that time. They were on the outside of that looking in, and yet this better hope, this better law, this this better everything that we have in Christ doesn't exclude anyone. It is open to everyone who chooses to come into contact with the blood of Christ by complete obedience to His Word. It is better. It is not exclusive. It's inclusive of all. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Paralleling the patriarchal law, also coming to an end at the death of Christ. Yes, and 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 the law of Christ able to be one law for all people, inclusive of everyone. Absolutely. Uh, let's. Well, we've got time to get through question number eleven. Uh, one more thing here. How many better things can you find in Hebrews? So how many better things, if we read through Hebrews, can we find? find, Can anybody find more than five? One of us. All right, Don, it's me and you. (laughs) I wrote down 15 different things. Okay. Okay. Okay.
Okay. Okay, so what was better? So yeah, so uh, Don came up with 15 things. I, I had 12 where the literal words are used better. Uh, the, the idea of better literally used. And so, uh, yeah, if let's, um, we, we see better hope here uh, in, in this passage, um, of course, uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 19. Um, but if we, if we flip back, um, he talks about, a, yeah, as you said, superior to the angels, um, or a better name, Hebrews 1 and verse 4. I'm looking back here in my notes. Um, yeah, having a, a, as a name uh, more excellent than theirs. The idea of a name in, in Hebrews 1 and verse 4. If we look over to Hebrews 6 and verse 9, um, we're sure of better things in Hebrews 6 and verse 9. And, and in that regard, he's talking about salvation, better things there being uh, a, a better salvation, kind of drawing a conclusion, if you will, from both of those things. But um, if we look, as we said, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 19, uh, better hope. Um, I think Hebrews 7 and 22, better covenant. Uh, 8 and 6, better covenant, better promises. 9 and 23, better sacrifices. 10, 34, better possessions. 11, 16, a better country. 11, 35, resurrection. Uh, and then 11, 40 and 12, 24 talk about, again, better, uh, better things. So, um, so over and over again, whether it's 12 or 15, we can read a number of times throughout the book of Hebrews, uh, as we've already alluded to, uh, this morning, and that is that we live under a law that is better. And we're also not looking to a time where we will be under a different law. Uh, the law that we were un are under, um, all men for the remainder of time, as time uh, passes on this earth, will live under this same perfect and complete law uh, under which we live now. But we've got maybe a minute. Uh, I, we have an hour according to the clock, but that's wrong. And so we'll, we'll stop uh, very quickly. But any other questions or comments uh, this morning before? I don't want to get into the next question. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, under the old law, did they know a better hope was coming? Or a better, did they know that there was something coming, a, a Messiah? I mean, absolutely. We see proof of that in, um, in, in the New Testament even where they say, well, we, we heard of this Messiah, we knew this Messiah was coming. And yet, it wasn't clear to them what that was, was it? And so they would have had the priests to look to and, and the old law, but, but knowing it wasn't perfect, there was still something else to come. And yet we get to see very clearly what that is. Our hope is built on nothing less, right? Uh, than, than, and so, so we have that better hope, that complete hope um, to, to be able to look at. Yes, sir. Final thought. Yeah, their hope was in a person, and, and our hope is in Christ. Uh, and so, yeah, ours is certainly, certainly better. Uh, all right, well, I appreciate your comments this morning uh, and your participation. Uh, we'll be beginning our worship hour in about 10 minutes, and uh, so I uh, appreciate it. We will pick up here on Wednesday evening uh, on page number 11.